Hello, and welcome to the Indie Author Podcast. Today, my guest is Mary Atkins. Hey, Mary, how are you doing? Hey, I'm so glad to be here. I'm very happy to have you here. To give our listeners and viewers a little bit of background on you, Mary Atkins is a writing coach, podcast host, and founder of The Book Incubator, a 12-month program to write, revise, and pitch your novel or memoir. She's the author of the novels When You Read This, Privilege, and Palm Beach, which was described by Associated Press as like a sandy beach, equal parts beautiful and uncomfortable, which I loved. Her books have been published in 13 countries, and her essays and reporting have appeared in the New York Times, The Atlantic, Slate, and more. A graduate of Yale Law School and Duke University, she helps aspiring authors finish their books with joy and clarity. And so we're going to be talking today actually about a topic that's like the opposite of joy and clarity, and that is how to write from trauma without re-traumatizing yourself. And so, Mary, I'm going to start out asking you what happened in your life that led you to talk about this as a kind of a topic of specialty. Yeah, thank you for having me, by the way, to talk about this. This is a topic that has only become of special interest to me and sort of a passion in the last year and a half or so, because I, as you just said, I'm a novelist really over, over the past five or so years. I've, that's really been my writing career is publishing fiction. The three books I've published have all been novels, but I had an experience a couple it's now been a couple of years ago where I, for the first time, decided I wanted to to write nonfiction and long form nonfiction. I'd published some essays before, some personal narrative essays, but I had never written a full memoir. And then I experienced, essentially experienced a year of recurrent pregnancy loss. So I had three preg- three miscarriages in under a year in about 10 months. And those 10 months were really obviously traumatic and full of grief. There was a lot of like emotional whiplash because it would be full of hope and then disappointed and then hope and then disappointment. But it was also a really transformative year for me. And I, I had the bizarre experience of going through it and looking back on it and not wishing it away, even as I was deeply, um, like in grief over it, I also saw how it was, had been a pretty pivotal period of my life and it had awoken me to some truths about my life and being alive and what it means and what I value that I had been blind to before. And so in that way, I was actually, I was really grateful for that year. And I wanted to write about that. I wanted to write about how these losses really gave me a new gave me a new outlook on the, on life and on the world. And so I decided to write a memoir and I, I, sorry, this is a long-winded way of answering your question of how I came to this, but I went into writing a memoir. So I had never written about anything, especially traumatic happening to me. I would say I, I had written about traumatic things happening to other people through fiction. And a lot of times that would be informed by experience I had, or that I had been close to people who had, but that like layer of fiction was a degree of self-protection that I think I sort of took for granted. I, it was a way of accessing some accessing traumatic things that in a way that that was not I would not have described it as triggering in any way it was essentially just getting to access like the feelings and talk about the feelings without having to go back to the truth of anything that had really occurred so this was really different and I confess like I was pretty ignorant going into writing a memoir about this like thinking oh this will just sort of be cathartic (laughs) I thought this will be cathartic And I I don't think that was, even though I laugh, like, I don't think that was a totally silly approach because it's true. I I, I love writing and I had always found writing cathartic and I've always been a journaler and journaling has been such like a mental health necessity for me since I was a teenager. So I've always had a really like healthy and helpful relationship with writing, but I had also never gone through anything this traumatic. Like this was the most, that year was the most traumatic The series of the most traumatic events that had happened to me in my life. So I returning to them, I was not aware of just how intense it would be to return to them and write about them. Luckily I was working with a memoir coach who was really 
trauma-informed coach. She also does life coaching and she knew this is going to be intense. And she warned me. I also just serendipitously happened to be working with a writer. I was his writing coach, but he was a trauma therapist and he was really interested in doing some teaching in my program on writing through trauma. And it was really serendipitous because I started meeting with him doing some reading. I read, I had never read the body keeps the score, which was, so that was super enlightening to me to read that book about how trauma is stored in our bodies. And so as I was writing, I found, I think because of these, uh, the support system I had, I had, I was doing some reading. I had my own memoir coach. I had my friend and my own client who was acting as a support to me. And through all of that, it helped me not be surprised when I would sit there writing and I would find that I was having physical reactions. Like my body would, I would shake, I would shake as I was writing, or I would, when I was writing fiction, I would often, uh, and I still do, but it's just been a while. So that's why I was talking in the past tense. But like, whenever I've written fiction, I would, I'll write for a couple of hours or two. And then I typically find it quite easy to segue into whatever else I want to do next, whether it's sending some emails or making some lunch or going to pick up my son. And that was not the case with my memoir. I found that I would need a long time to come down off of writing. I would take these really long walks, like just go walk for miles after writing, going back and writing about a particular experience. And, and heat really helped too. I was writing in the summer. So a lot of times, like even just going outside, I live in Tennessee, so it's hot in the summer. So like just going outside and being in the heat would be physically comforting. But I think the more, the more important point is that I learned to seek out ways to comfort myself. Like what did my body need in this moment? And to honor that, whatever that was. And often that was not just going right into the next work project or just like shifting gears or going to like I said, pick up my son or do something else. I I couldn't just immediately shift gears like that. So I essentially wrote a draft of my memoir this way. And this is how I became really interested in this topic because I just through personal experience, just having to learn to take care of myself through writing about this hard thing. So many questions based on that. (laughs) I guess the first one is, why did you decide to write a memoir versus writing about it in a fictional setting, which would have given you that buffer that you mentioned yeah. before? So that's, I've wondered that too. And I don't really know what the answer is, except that in this case, I did not want the buffer. I felt it was almost like a calling or a, like an urge, that burning feeling. Like I felt this burning feeling to just write the truth. This is exactly what happened. And this is how it felt. And I didn't want to hide it behind fictional characters. And the reason I know that is because at first I tried, (laughs) I came up with a book premise with a novel premise about loss and it just felt hollow as I was working on it. I just couldn't get my heart behind it. And when I started just writing as myself, just narrating exactly what had happened to me, I just felt. Like it was just pouring out and it did have all this energy in it. It's what I wanted to be doing. Can you imagine later going back to that fictional premise? Maybe not that one, but a different one and treating it in a future fictional work after having had the experience of the nonfictional memoir work? Yeah, I think so for sure. And I think, because I think it's the kind of topic that I've since learned so many people, so many women experience this. And I didn't know that. I thought when I first miscarried, I thought I did not know anyone who had miscarried, <laughs> but that's not true. I had known, I knew a number of people who had miscarried. I just didn't know it because they hadn't told me because there's this taboo around it. And it wasn't until I had that I found out people would start saying, oh yeah, I did too. I did too. And it was like, oh, it turns out I know a ton of people who have, but just no one ever talks about it. So I would love, you know, I feel like it's something I would like to see more in fiction just as a reader. And I do think I can see myself coming back to it later after I get this one out of me, because it is, it's that burning feeling of, I have to write this for whatever reason. I don't know if it'll get out there in the world. Maybe I just have to write it for myself, but it's that burning feeling of, I can't do anything else until this is out of me. I think a really interesting companion 
episode to this one is episode 149. I talked with Anne-Marie Kelly Harbaugh about using vulnerability to feed your creativity. And oh. it's just interesting because so many of the things we're talking about here are reflected in the conversation I had with Anne-Marie, a different perspective, but that same idea of getting through trauma and using writing in order to, to deal with it. So when you're thinking about this driving force that led you to do the memoir or to be working on the memoir, how do you balance what you feel like you need therapeutically as a writer and what you want to deliver to the readers of that memoir? Yeah, I, so I'm still very much at the first draft stage. I've really only written the first draft of it and a proposal. I have written a proposal, but that I pulled that proposal out of the first draft. I, and that I purely, I, well, I'm already second guessing myself as I say <laughs> that I essentially wrote what I needed to write, but with an eye to just a couple of things like, what is the theme? Like the memoir coach I was working with, she was very good about being like, what is this book about? What is this book about in one sentence? And then whenever I would write something, she would say, is this story really about what this book is about? Like, is this really on your theme? And if it wasn't, we would, she would direct me back to writing about what the book was about. And so I found, I found it, it's interesting in that way. I think it was like, I, I tried to find the sweet spot where it was both of those things, because for me, what the book was really about is the same thing as what I really needed, why I needed to write it, because I was trying to make sense of how I had changed. I knew I had changed, but I didn't really know how, like I couldn't articulate how I had changed. I just knew I had. I knew I valued um, the moment to moments more. I knew that I was much more in touch with my emotions. Like I knew that I could feel, felt sad a lot more often, but that it wasn't a bad thing. It was like, well, the, the sadness I'm feeling is about the fact that there's loss in me and around me all the time. Like even as my son gets older and there are all these happy milestones he's reaching, like it's because his childhood is ending and then it's going to be over and then I'm going to be over. And that's sad. <laughs> and it, it yeah. was never not true before, but before I think, I think I, I've functioned by trying to pretend that wasn't true. <laughs> like really just distracting myself with work and achievement and pleasure. And like, just really trying not to face, not to look at the very real presence of death that's around us all the time. And it's interesting because when I really started writing about this year of my life, I realized that I had been, yeah, I didn't know before I started having miscarriages that I, I thought a miscarriage was like a one day event, like a graduation. <laughs> I don't know. I thought it was just like, it happened and it's over. And in my case, it, they took months. I mean, a miscarriage lasted weeks and weeks. At one point, I, one of my miscarriages lasted 40 days. And in that sense, I looked back on this year and realized I was, I was holding death. I was pregnant with death more that year than I was pregnant with life. I was literally, I was like walking around with death in my body. And I think that that is one reason why I had no choice, but to become intimate with it because I felt like it, it, it not only was around me so much of that year, it was in me. I felt it in me. And, and what I found was that it's not as scary as I feared, but it is sad. It is as sad as I feared. And that, I think that was a big takeaway. And, but I didn't realize that until I was writing, I've discovered all of this through writing about it. Can you share what the one sentence was that you worked on with your memoir coach that was always the sort of North star for your writing? Yeah, it evolved. It evolved, but at one, sorry. So I'm remembering all the different iterations. The one that carried us for a while was how three miscarriages in one year helped me surrender to the wonder of life. And I think that was the one we stuck with most of all. At one point it did shift to how it's about how a year and three miscarriages helped me embrace the paradoxical nature of loss, which is also true. So yeah, like I said, we, we shifted it a few times, but there was always one, there was always a touchstone that we were going back to. 
Well, that's interesting because the sentence not only is a good guidestone for you, a guide point for you, and indicates the significance of the book to you, but try not to sound crass about this, but it's like the tagline yeah. for a reader to understand yeah. whether this book is for them or not, whether they want to pick up this memoir and the idea of, I think, the wonder of life is going to draw people in, I think, more than the paradox mm -hmm. of life. And that could be useful, both from a marketing point of view, but also from a personal point of view. Like if the lens that you look through is quite different between those two perspectives, those two yes. one summaries. And I think reflects an evolution that it's not just the tagline, but it's the evolution of the tagline that I'm imagining helped you in the right is helping you in the writing of the memoir. Oh, I love that interpretation. Yeah, I think that's true. And I like, yeah, I really like what you just said. I think there's also, you're right. If I think about a reader's perspective, paradox is, paradox is like a neutral term. It's kind of heady, right? It's like an intellectual right. kind of, it right. doesn't have a lot of feeling. Wonder is like lovely, right? <laughs> like yeah. wonder is beautiful. And it's something we all, I love experiencing wonder. And I feel like. I'm often in search of it. So it's a really, it's actually a very different, those two sentences are, have really different feelings to them. It does feel like the mindset of someone going into the project and the mindset of someone who's worked through the project, maybe not wrapping it up, but worked through it enough that you've gleaned the kinds of benefits that it sounds like you were looking to get from yeah. the writing experience, from that experience. Yeah, I like that. That sounds true. Do you feel like you're at a point in the drafting of your memoir where the focus is still mostly on yourself or mostly on the reader? And independent of what your answer is to that, do you think that that's going to continue through your whole effort of the memoir or does that shift at some point? I think it's just shifted to the reader. And for me, this, this experience is very similar to my fiction writing because what I do and what I teach when I'm working with writers who are working on novels is not to actually think about the reader at all on the first draft because the first draft is just trying to figure out what the story is. And I found that to be true with memoir, even though I had lived it, I was still trying to figure out what the story is. But then now that I have a draft, it becomes like, for me, it becomes about, okay, now I'm worried about the reader. No, I'm not worried about it, but now I'm thinking about the reader's experience of this story. And I now need to shape up this raw material that I've created so that it gives the experience that I, I want the reader to have. But I can't think about that while I'm writing a first draft. I, I, I can't think about that and experience the story. Like I, you've probably heard this before. I don't even know who said this to me the first time or where I read it, but I just love it so much. The first draft of anything is like someone telling you your, the story or you telling yourself the story. And I just really liked that because it just really, for me, it just really simplifies it. It's like, we're just trying to get down what is even happening here on the first draft. And then after that, we can start thinking about how someone else will experience this story because now we know what the story is. Well, I'm curious as you start moving into that phase where you're thinking about the reader's experience, do you find yourself either editing things out that you would otherwise put when you were writing it for yourself or adding things in that you wouldn't bother adding in when you were writing it for yourself and factoring in things like reader triggers and how do you warn them responsibly about what they're going to be reading about and things like that? Yeah. I have thought about that and I haven't come up with a sort of a unified solution to it, the reader trigger question, but I do, in my case, I want to be very clear in the marketing of my book, what, what it's about. I don't want to, anyone to be surprised that this is multiple miscarriages. I don't want anyone to read the first pregnancy loss and then think the worst is over and only to get slammed two more times. Like, that's not anything I'm interested in doing. I don't want, need to replicate. And that's how it felt in life, but I don't need to replicate for that for the reader. So I think just in terms of the back of the book copy, and like, I think that's the best place and just in the marketing of the book to really give people a heads up. This is what's going to be in here. So just, just so you're ready and you can decide if you want to proceed or not. But it's interesting, I think with memoir, I did get a note from my literary agent on one part of my memoir draft that that gave me pause because it was so different than when I write fiction. So when I write fiction, 
I'll get a note from usually my editor and it'll be like, can you go into more of what she was thinking here? Can you go into more of what this character was thinking or feeling here? And then it's like, sure, no problem. Let me invent it, right? And then when I got that note on a moment in my memoir, <laughs> it was like, huh, I can't invent it because this is a true story. And the truth is, in this moment, I don't know that I was thinking or feeling anything because I think it was dissociating. Like I, in this moment, I don't, it doesn't get deeper than what I wrote here because I was just trying to get through the next five minutes. And I think there are different ways to approach that, like to approach that in the writing, right? Like I could say, I could narrate as Mary the writer now, like looking back in this moment, I wasn't thinking any of these things because I was dissociating. I was trying to get through the next five minutes. I mean, I could just actually write that. But that's a very different solution than in the fiction where you just, where you invent. And it was interesting because I found myself, speaking of writing about trauma, I really, I think, and this is not so much about how to write about trauma without re-triggering yourself as just the challenge of writing about trauma is that I think sometimes we go back and we get a blank because it's our brain is protecting us from having to go there again. So it's like, I don't, you know, my agent who I'm very close to and whose opinions I respect so much will ask very thoughtful questions. Like in this moment, were you thinking this? I can imagine you were thinking this or feeling this. And my brain goes, I'm not going to give you anything. I'm not going to tell you anything that you were thinking or feeling in that moment because I don't want to go back there. <laughs> so just even just trying to access some of that, I think can be its own psychological, um, not a game game sounds too flippant, but just, yeah, like a writerly challenge that I did not, didn't naturally didn't have to experience with fiction because in fiction it's inventing and creating and not having to just like access memories that our brain has really complex ways of trying to avoid. <laughs> I'm wondering what kind of lessons you were able to carry forward from your fiction experience into the writing of the memoir. And one example might be how you structured the memoir, for example, but I'm also thinking yeah. that another example could be a way filling in those blanks in a way that's true to the memoir truthfulness mm -hmm. and yet is accommodating a reader's need to understand what was going on. You alluded to that when you were saying, maybe I step back as Mary the writer and I, I admit that I was dissociating and I didn't really, I didn't really have anything to share because of that. But what lessons are you carrying forward from your fiction like that? Yeah, I think you're right. That structure is a big um, like structure is a skill that I learned through writing fiction, long form fiction, how to structure a narrative so that it state that is interesting for 70 plus thousand words. And so I went into my memoir, even before I knew what it was about, I had a sense of what the structure would be because that's just what my brain did. <laughs> I thought, okay, well, this is a structure that could work. We'll have three parts Part one will be this part, part two will be this part, part three will be this part. And I even knew what my struggle was in each part and how that through line would move through the book, even as I wasn't quite sure what the ultimate takeaway was going to be at the end. So structure for sure, learn through fiction. And then another thing, I mean, I've talked about this a little bit already, but like not judging that first draft, I think that is a skill it took me and many of us, I'm sure a long time to really turn into a habit, not judging the words as they come out, because I truly trust that like, I will future Mary <laughs> will come in and revise this and polish it up for public consumption. It's not for public consumption yet. No one ever has to read this part. So I'm not going to sweat it right now. And that was a really hard one skill. Um, and I call it a skill because I think it is a skill. Like that's, it's hard to do that for people. And it was for me too, for a long time. And I think I ultimately did get there with fiction and that carried over to the memoir too. Just not, I mean, no one's read my first full first draft and I plan to keep it that way. <laughs> I'm guessing you're not working on fiction at the same time because you'd already mentioned this need of having oh. a buffer uh, around the memoir writing. Did you know that you were going to have to set aside some chunk of time in your writing life to just focus on the memoir, recognizing 
at the beginning that you weren't going to be able to do other projects at the same time? I only ever really focus on one project at a time. That has always been the only way that I can do it because I get pretty obsessed. Like it, it's all consuming. And sometimes people have asked me like, wow, you write really fast. How do you write so fast? Because I do write pretty quickly. But the one reason I write pretty quickly is because I, I just am all consuming. I, like it's what I think about when I wake up. It's what I think about when I'm falling asleep. It's what I think about in the shower. And I think when you're living and breathing it like that, you can only do it for so long. You know, I don't know that this only that I would do that for like years of one project. So for me, it ends up being a handful of months that I'm like exclusively dating <laughs> this one project. And then it's been so intense that I need a break from it. Do you um, take a break before your next creative activity? Do you do something entirely different before you write yes, something else? Yes, completely different. Usually like baking, sourdough, bread. I'm very into sourdough. (laughs) It's very cliche from the pandemic, but I am. Or trying just new recipes in a cookbook or it's funny. It's like a teeter yoga and writing are like a teeter totter to me. So it's like, I will be all in on writing and I won't be doing any really physical movement or anything. And then when I'm not writing, I'll just be doing yoga pretty obsessively. I, it's an obsessive personality trait. So it just kind of shift and do something else. So right now I'm in a big yoga mode because I finished that first draft and I set that aside and I'm letting it bake. And so I'm doing lots of yoga and bread baking. (laughs) Those are both very healthy things. I'm wondering if there are red flags for writers who are working on a memoir, working on even fiction that has a traumatic person element for them. And do you have tips for how people deal with dealing with that trauma or red flags that say you really need to back off or you really need to dive yeah. in or whatever you think your advice would I mean, be there. It's interesting. Okay. So this is from not only going through this myself, but from working with some writers on writing through their own trauma over the past year, I have noticed something that I want to share, <laughs> which is that, so there's this saying that I had heard before and that sounds very smart. And i had always thought it sounded very smart. And now I don't agree with it, <laughs> which is, I don't know if you've heard it, but they say, sometimes people will say, write from your scars, not from your wounds. I have never heard that before, but it's never kind of gruesome. It is. It is <laughs> gruesome. It is gruesome. And it also sounds very wise. It like does. It, it sounds does. Wise. Yeah. It makes you kind of go, hmm. And I think it's a like kind of BS because- I think the idea here that the, my understanding of that adage is that it's to protect people from re-triggering themselves, re-traumatizing. This is already something that's raw, but I think that it doesn't distinguish between writing and publishing, publishing about publishing something when it's extremely raw it, to me does seem extremely vulnerable and in a way that could be dangerous because when we publish, we put ourselves out there. We subject ourselves to all kinds of nasty people on the internet who say all kinds of terrible things. And just, at least to me, yeah, <laughs> but I'm pretty yeah. sure every author has that, but yeah. we just, we, you, and, and that just comes with the territory. So if you're, you gotta be prepared for that. So if it's something tender, maybe it's not the time, but writing I have only found writing to be therapeutic. Yes. It brings back the trauma. Yes. My body will shake. Yes. I need to go outside, but that's not because that's not unhealthy. In fact, I actually think it's a very natural way of dealing with what's in my, in the body. Like it's not that it's not there. If you're not writing about it, it's just being suppressed. Right. So it's like lancing the boil to extend the like lancing. Yes. 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 So it's, I actually think writing from your wounds can be a way of healing your wound. And that doesn't have to mean publishing your wound. <laughs> We're keeping up the gruesome metaphor here. But <laughs> okay, that's a long way of saying you said red flags for a writer. So I think I would never tell a writer not to write about something because I don't actually think that's, I don't think the solution is like, let's just keep suppressing it you know, suppress it for another 20 years until it's really tough scar tissue and then write about it. I don't think that's the solution. I think it's more be gentle with yourself, observe your body's reactions, ask it what it needs. If it needs, there was one day I was like, I am not okay. I'm shaking. 
I feel very anxious from writing about this. I can, I felt it coursing through my body and I just decided to say like, okay, what do you need to my body? And it said, we need to go get a chocolate chip cookie and go on a walk. <laughs> so I went and got a chocolate chip cookie and I went on a walk. And it's like, I saw, I think often there are just like very kind of childlike needs that it may be having that aren't even that hard to fill, but like recognizing how it's coming up in, in the body, because the body will remember, even if your brain is struggling to, and that's one thing I learned from the trauma therapist I was working with for a bit. And another thing, so not red, the red flag would not be a red flag signaling not to write. The red flag would be a sort of signal from your body that you need to take care of yourself as you're writing and whatever that looks like. Well, you had a couple of nice resources there. It sounded like your memoir coach was one of them, but also the fact that you coincidentally had a client mm -hmm. who had that experience. So if people are venturing into this um, a difficult area, do you have advice for how they can find the resources, whether it's people or, or other resources, you yeah. know, the walk outside in the warm weather is one, but what resources are available out there to people who want to get through this experience in a healthy way? I would start with the book, The Body Keeps the Score and writers tend to be readers. So we like, so either reading that, or if you don't want to read a whole book, just read about it. Or there's some just great YouTube videos that sort of encapsulate and summarize some of the major takeaways from that book, but just understanding how the trauma is locked in your body, I think goes a really long way. And then there are coaches and people who can help you through dealing with trauma. And my client who, again, serendipitously, I was talking to as I was going through this, had learned from his name's Gabor Mate. He's pretty well known as someone who writes a lot about this. He has some books out. He has also more videos if people prefer to watch videos. But there's a lot that you can just even just get for free on the internet that'll help you understand. Look up Gabor Mate, look up The Body Keeps the Score. That'll help you understand what's actually happening. When you sit down to write about this, another thing that I think was new for me and was really helpful. I mean, I mentioned a few minutes ago, this idea that sometimes our brains are protecting us from going back there and it will just shut down and there will be a blank. And, uh, and something my client Jeffrey taught me is if you don't remember how, for example, if I don't remember how nine-year-old Mary felt when something was happening to her and I say, I don't remember, I don't remember anything. Then you can say, well, how would another nine, do you, do I know someone who's nine now? Yes, I do. My niece is nine. Okay. How would, how do I think she would feel if this happened to her now? And then I start saying how I would think she or another nine-year-old or a hypothetical nine-year-old would feel as this were happening. And then you ask, well, is it possible that that's how I felt at the time? And then it, it's an interesting way, speaking of fiction being a buffer, this is like, this is almost a way of using a fiction of another person and putting them in your shoes and asking how they would feel to somehow get back around to how you very well might've felt and probably did, but you're just, you've blocked it off. So that's just one little exercise people can do. Yeah. <laughs> but there's a lot more for that in the world of Gabor Mate, again, is his name. There's, there are more exercises like that can help people access and understand what's happened to them, which of course is essential to writing about it, but also just healthy, just so you know, you, you can kind of process that and not have it be this sort of unresolved tight tightness in you. Are you starting to feel a resolution coming to your situation based on your writing of the memoir? I'm a little bit anxious about the part where I shape it up for the reader because I haven't done that with something so personal before. Like I'm actually quite anxious about it. I just think that'll, that's just going to be a new challenge. Like taking something that really happened to me, my life, you know, material for my own life and then presenting it, wrapping it up and putting a bow on it, which I know is like a crass way of putting it, but I'll, of course, if I'm going to write a book, I want to think about how the reader is experiencing it. And I think that's going to be that, that might feel strange. I think it will feel strange, but that's, so I think I am sort of putting that off a little bit. I'll get to it at some point. <laughs>
<laughs> well, Barry, you're going to have to keep us informed one way or the other. You're going to have to let me and the listeners and viewers know how that journey goes for you. But thank you so much for talking about that, for being so open about your experience. And I'm going to be very interested to see where that memoir goes. And please let the listeners and viewers know where they can go to find out more about you and everything you do online. Great. Well, they can go to maryadkinswriter.com and that's Adkins with a D like dog. So Mary Adkins writer, or they can go to the bookincubator.com. The book incubator is the program that I run. So both places have information on where to find me and my podcast. If you're interested in listening. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you.